Hello everyone, welcome! This is the fourth lecture of the second issue of the Bulletin of Near Eastern Excavations and Research. And uh, as you probably know if you attended our previous encounters, I am Valentina Santini. But before introducing today's speaker, I would like to remind you that uh, the aim of the Bulletin is to update not only the scientific community, but also university students and the general public on current archaeological excavations and ongoing projects in the Near East, and that at the end of the lecture there will be a section specifically dedicated to discussion. Therefore, if you have questions, please use the live chat which is here on this page of YouTube next to the video and at the end of the presentation I'm going to read your comments to our speaker. Well, now it's time to introduce our speaker, Adam Smith, a Goldwyn Smith Professor of Anthropology at Cornell University, who will talk about Project Haragats, two decades of archaeological research in central Armenia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valentina. I want to thank Valentina and Stefano uh, Guido and all the folks at Comnes for the kind invitation to speak to this virtual gathering. Now, I realize it is a poor substitute for the you know, quaint streets and sumptuous cuisine of Florence, but for now, I suppose that this uh, virtual background will have to do for our uh, Florentine moment. As this lecture series is dedicated to updates on in-progress archaeological research programs, it seemed an opportune moment to look back on the collaborative work of Project Aragots and the uh, studies that we have undertaken in central Armenia over the last two decades plus. And I want to highlight some of the new directions that our research team is now undertaking in the area of heritage education and preservation. Let me first start my slideshow. Second. There we go. Now, Ruben Badalyan and I established Project Aragats in 1998 as a joint American Armenian exploration of long term processes of social, economic, and political change in the South Caucasus. Our field teams were small but close knit, establishing a culture of collaboration that has remained vital to our work throughout our years together. As our team grew, the questions driving the research got deeper in a historical sense, as well as broader conceptually and our methodological commitments likewise expanded apace. PhD dissertations were penned and long-term members became co-directors, leading entire new areas of research. By the end of our first decade, Project Aragats had developed into a multinational, multi-generational umbrella organization, supporting research from the medieval period through the, uh, from the Neolithic to the medieval period, and introducing a range of new field and analytical techniques to the archaeology of the Caucasus. During our second decade, our work extended into new areas of more pressing immediacy. In an analytic sense, this work is most clearly embodied in Lori Kachidorian's work on Soviet ruins and the remains of Armenia's contemporary past. But this material legacy had already been visible to us even during the very first days of our regional survey. As here you see uh, Pavel Apatisian with one of the rockets discovered in a uh, uh, Russian military proving ground where we were doing survey. This concern for the immediacy of the moment within which our work was situated also generated greater formal engagement with the communities of potential stakeholder, heritage stakeholders. In 2014, we established the Aragots Foundation as the charitable arm of our program with the goal of using our experience in the region to advance initiatives in community education, and heritage preservation. This work has recently moved to the forefront of our activities in the aftermath of the fall 2020 renewed hostilities in the region of Nagorno-Karabakh. While the conflict began as a political, military, and humanitarian crisis, the terms of the ceasefire have rapidly turned the region into a looming cultural heritage crisis. And in the last section of my talk today, I want to return to our efforts to help safeguard cultural heritage in the region. But before I turn to that issue, I want to first narrate the work that Project Aragots and the Aragots Foundation have undertaken over the last 23 years by paying particular attention to the overarching thematic agenda that has served to orient the work of the students and colleagues who, has helped, who have helped drive the project's long-term research program. 
despite the diversity of our team's anthropological interests, archeological materials, and historical fascinations, our investigations have been shaped by four overarching intellectual goals. First, we sought to examine our study area as an integrated landscape rather than just a series of isolated sites. We have drawn upon a suite of field and laboratory techniques that highlight the dynamic articulation of places, practices, and institutions. Second, we sought to re-examine the basic outlines of Southern Caucasia's archeological chronology in order to place existing conventions on sounder empirical footing. Third, we wanted to push the theoretical foundations of archeology span in the South Caucasus beyond the formulation of culture areas to consider the co-constitution of material culture and social life. And finally, we wanted to engage with and develop the capacities of local communities to preserve and understand Armenia's cultural heritage. This meant developing capacity in both the scholarly apparatus within, for example, the Institute of Archeology span and Ethnography, but also developing capacity within local communities that stood for us as potential stakeholders in the region's archeological remains. Now, the last time I gave a talk at Kamnes, my focus was on Bronze Age metaphysics. But today I want to descend quite a few rungs down Hawks's ladder of inference to focus on four areas of Project Aragatz's research program. First, I want to provide a very brief history of the project and its development over what will soon be a quarter century. Second, I'm going to provide an introduction to the region by outlining the Bayesian chronological model that my colleague Stuart Manning helped us put together based on our large corpus of radiocarbon dates and dendrochronological materials. Third, I want to put together the numerous studies of my students and colleagues that have provided us with detailed multi-scalar account of early and late Bronze Age economies in the region. And last, I want to briefly describe two of the heritage related initiatives that we are undertaking under the auspices of the Aragots Foundation. And I'm gonna to try to do all of that in about 45 minutes or so. So first, Project Aragots traces its roots to an earlier seminal program of multi-country country investigations that was known as IPARC, the International Program for Anthropological Research in the Caucasus. IPARC was founded by Philip Cole, Ruben Badalyan and the late Zalk Kodze in the early 1990s. And I was fortunate to join their team as an impressionable graduate student. And I learned a great deal from both my archeological and ethnographic experiences at the time. With excavations centered at the site of Haram in Armenia, Satka in Southern Georgia and Beli Kent in Dagestan, IPARC established the kind of broad geographic vision and deeply collaborative work ethic that would become fundamental to how we conceptualize the more localized, yet also multi-sided work of Project Aragots. Aragots was also designed from the outset to be methodologically heterogeneous, a program of ex exploration where intensive regional pedestrian survey would then inform a subsequent phase of multi-sided excavations, which would then in turn shape research design for material analyses and ultimately additional regional surveys. This was an approach with a deep, if somewhat lost tradition in the South Caucasus, reaching back to the integration of survey, excavation and architectural history defined by Nikolai Mars team at ANI in the late 19th and early 20th century. So we had roots that reach back intellectually quite far. We began our first season of field work in 1998 with a plan to survey two areas at the base of Mount Aragats, the Tsakovi Plain in the north and the hilly uplands of Aragat Soten that separate the Shirak and Ararat Plain. Let me highlight this for you. Here's the, Shirak, the Tsakovi Plain and the hilly flanks of Aragat Soten. We commenced work in the Tsakovi Plain and it was immediately clear from the incredible density of remains that we would not be getting to our second area in Aragat Soten anytime soon. And indeed, when it came time to extend our survey of the Tsakovic Plain in 2014, we instead moved south into the Cossack Valley with a program led by Ian Lindsay and Alan Green. So this area of Aragat Soten on the western slope of Mount Aragats remains on our very long-term to-do list. In the Tsakovic Plain, we conducted two full seasons of intensive pedestrian survey, 
developing a detailed map of the region's dense archaeological landscape across a total area of almost 100 square kilometers. We record a range of different site types, ranging from cemeteries to animal holding pens to irrigation facilities and small settlements. And what was immediately clear was that the regional archaeological landscape was shaped most forcefully by a feverish phase of construction during the Late Bronze Age, between roughly 1500 and 1200 BC, that installed an extensive series of stone masonry fortified sites around the periphery of the plain. These sites included both large centers, such as those at Zakhovit and Henneberg, as well as smaller specialty sites, such as Gerot, which you'll hear quite more, much more about today, as well, and also surveillance outposts, such as those at Ashut Yerkart and Polozar in the far north, which kept watch over the passes through the mountains of the Pombok Range. At the same time, the region's late Bronze Age building boom also transformed the mountain slopes surrounding the plain into a vast necropolis, with cemeteries of variable sizes represented by each of the red dots you see along the hilly flanks in this map. The funerary architecture within the cemeteries included both Purgon style tumuli and the various models of cromlechs, the stone ringed uh, uh, chamber tombs. Most although by no means all of these tombs appear to date to this late Bronze Age phase of construction. The Kurgans at Gegerot provided critical assemblages for Hannah Chazen's 2016 PhD dissertation from the University of Chicago, while the large cluster of Kromlex in Tsakohovitz burial cluster 12, just to the southeast of the site itself, provided the focus for Maureen Marshall's 2014 dissertation, also from Chicago. Large-scale excavations in the settlement and mortuary com uh, complexes at Tsakovit and Gegerot commenced in 2002, even as we conducted test excavations at the region's other settlement sites. At Tsakovit, this included not only our own excavations at the uh, terraces and on the citadel, but also Ian Lindsay's exploration of ex extramural Late Bronze Age settlement beyond the confines of the site's cyclopean walls. This was conducted as part of his PhD dissertation research from UC Santa Barbara. In addition, Lori Kachadorian conducted excavations of the large Iron Three town that arose at the site during the Achaemenid period as the foundation for her dissertation from the University of Michigan. At the site of Gegerot, investigations explored the citadel, terrace, and lower slopes, the latter of which serve as a foci for research by both Armine Harutunyan and an in progress dissertation from Cornell by Gabriel Borenstein. Taken together, our excavations resulted in a very large corpus of radiocarbon dates that allowed us to develop a detailed Bayesian model of regional settlement chronology. This model has significantly narrowed the date ranges for our sites, allowing us to not only confidently date each strata of regional occupation and their corresponding ceramic complexes, but also to better specify the chronology of Armenia's bronze and iron ages in general. The model was based on 243 14C dates acquired from 221 well provenience samples. Let me start with the Early Bronze Age. The lower horizon of the Early Bronze Age at Gegerot is represented by the so-called Elar Aragat ceramic groups, which you see on the uh, lower left of the slide here. This ceramic, this uh, phase of our settlement is dated at Gegerot to 3007 to 2906 BC as you see summarized in this highlighted arrow, uh, plot here. The upper stratigraphic horizon at the site uh, is characterized instead by Karnut Shengevit ceramic group materials that you see illustrated here. Our model dates this occupation to 2864 to 2723, as you see in the middle here. Now there is a hiatus between these two layers of occupation, stratigraphically defined by a sterile layer of colluvial stand, uh, sand that appears to have lasted for about 40 years or so, suggesting that the two occupations represent a key discontinuity in the region's Kuroroxi settlement history. <clears throat> Excuse me. While the Gegero data do not appear to bear directly on the timing of the first emergence of the Kuroroxis, it does give us an interesting data point for thinking about the eventual disappearance of the phenomenon. When we modeled the interval between the end of the early Bronze Age at Gegerot 
And some of the earliest radiocarbon data for the initial Middle Bronze Age, for example, at Mark Kopi, there is a gap from of about 124 to 384 years that clearly needs to be a focus of regional attention in the coming years. Although we lack clear evidence of Middle Bronze Age occupation within the Tsakovi plain itself, this is a time when greater mobility appears to have contributed to a significant reduction in settlement sites across the South Caucasus. The Aragaz model nonetheless does hold implications for understanding of the late Bronze Age, the other end of the Bronze Age. Our data indicate a boundary start date for the Tsakovi plain's initial late Bronze Age occupations of between 1524 and 1435 BC, suggesting that the transition from the Middle Bronze to the Late Bronze may well have begun about a generation or so earlier than previously traditionally understood. This indeed accords well with the substantial assemblage of transitional Middle to Late Bronze ceramics that we documented both at Gegerot and in the Kurgans below. You can see here the very clear traces of Sivan Uzerlik terminal middle bronze style decoration on pottery from what was late bronze one levels. During the late bronze one occupation, roughly 1422 to 1246, fortified centers were erected at Gegerot, Hennebert, and Sokohovit, which you see denoted by the orange circles on the map. This occupation phase came to a dramatic end with a conflagration that destroyed most of the site of Gegerot. But it was followed immediately by subsequent occupations that cleared away much of the destruction debris and rebuilt. The fortress of Aragansi Baird, which you see here added to our group, appears to have emerged around this time. The site was investigated by Alan Green as part of his 2013 dissertation from the University of Chicago. And it appears likely erected during this second phase dated 1264 to 1186, as you see here in this plot. At the end of this second phase, all of the major sites in the region appear to have experienced a coordinated episode of wide-scale destruction and ultimate abandonment. That said, some traces of informal activities have been detected dating to the Iron I and II periods at Gegerot, the Gegerot Kurgans, Aragazi Baird, and Tsakovit as well. But it is only during the Iron III period of the mid first millennium BC that truly substantial occupation returns to the region with the construction of the large town at Tsakovit investigated by Ketchedorian. Now these advances in regional chronology have provided us with a robust framework for a broad collaborative effort to understand the forms of political economy that embedded the major settlements of the Tsakovit plain within attachments to the wider landscape. Archaeozoological and archaeobotanical evidence suggests that across the long sweep of the Tsakovi Plains Bronze and Iron Age past, the region was home to mixed subsistence economies that combined agricultural production that was largely a mixture of wheat and barley. Combine this with tending flocks of domesticated sheep and goat, principally during the early Bronze Age, cattle, which emerged as predominant during the late Bronze Age, and also horse rearing which is particularly significant, it appears, during the Iron III period occupations. Our understanding of the region's early Bronze Age subsistence economy stems primarily from the well-preserved EB1 and II levels at Gigarod, where we have recovered extensive inventories of paleobotanical and archaeozoological materials. As described by Roman Hovsepian, the Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography in Yerevan, Early Bronze Age agriculture on the Tsakovi Plain appears to have been based on cereal cultivation, particularly hulled barley and bread wheat, a pattern in some contrast with earlier Neolithic and Chalcolithic agricultural traditions in the South Caucasus, which were based on almost equal representation of cereals, pulses, and oil plants. The Early Bronze Age faunal assemblages from Gagarot, and as analyzed by Belinda Monahan are composed primarily of mammals and birds, although the non-mammalian remains are quite rare. Among the mammals identified to the level of genus, sheep and goats form the majority for both early bronze phases, although the Elar Aragat sample has a higher proportion of cattle than the later Karnuk Shegovit sample. Equids are indeed present in the early and late phases. However, only in the EB2, the Karnuk Shegovit phase, 
could they be identified more specifically as a single domesticated horse and also one onager? Pigs are also present in the EB2 sample, presenting some reason for us to suggest that the early Bronze Age settlements at Gegerot likely practiced only very limited transhumans. Maureen Marshall's biogeochemical research has added further evidence to the practices of agropastoralism. Analysis of 13C and 15N uh, isotopes in collagen and 13C isotopes in apatite have indicated that both early Bronze Age and late Bronze Age individuals who were interred in the Takovi Plain had a C3 protein to C3 whole diet that was involved consuming C3 plants such as barley and wheat, in addition to consuming other C3 consumers, most notably sheep and goat. Interestingly, Hannah Chazen has also examined strontian isotopes from late Bronze Age faunal remains from Gerot and Zakhovich. Her work has demonstrated that animals did not migrate extensively, but rather derived their food from primarily local sources. These data taken together clearly suggest that the rise of territorial polities based in the fortified citadels of this late Bronze Age explosion of construction drove along with it a concomitant reduction in the transhuman pastoral practices that we think were vital to the Middle Bronze Age economy. We will see additional evidence for the constriction of economic worlds in a moment when we return to the regional, to regional commodity exchanges during the late Bronze Age. So let me put that on hold. And let me turn from subsistence to durable goods. We have only limited data on local exchange networks during the early Bronze Age since only the settlement at Gagarot has been truly extensively documented. Although contemporary communities were in evidence at both Aragazzi Baird and at Takovid, as well as far, far, farther flung neighbors that have been recorded at Karnut to the west and Aberon III to the south. However, there is no evidence at present for significant asymmetries in, exchange, in early Bronze Age exchange networks that might indicate some kind of privileged settlement or a significant inequality in commodity exchanges across the early Bronze Age landscape. In contrast, local exchange in the Tsakovic plain during the late Bronze Age was highly asymmetric. We have documented this most clearly in the flow of clays in the form of archeologically recovered ceramics sourced by instrumental neutron activation analysis. These data clearly show that while most sites on the Tsakovi plain primarily relied on their local clay beds for the, the final endpoint ceramics, Gegerot, in contrast, attracted a very heterogeneous flow of ceramics into its spaces from both within the Tsakovi plain and their neighboring areas. And we'll return to this evidence for Gegerot's unique economic privilege in a moment. When we turn from clay and ceramics to another durable commodity, lithic resources, and specifically obsidian, we also necessarily shift the scale of our view from the immediate vicinity of the Tsakovi Plain and its clay beds to the wider South Caucasus and Armenian Highland obsidian uh, resources. Between 2015 and 2017, I conducted an initial exploration of early bronze and late bronze obsidian debris and finished products using PXRF assays of 924 samples. Since this time, I've added an additional 500 sample assays, but the statistical analysis on these materials is still ongoing. So primarily today, I'm going to be referencing the original set of 924. And these were primarily derived from the site of Gegerot and Aragazzi bed, which you can see in the table. I want to just highlight this constellation plot produced of just the obsidian sources within the South Caucasus. And you can see how they neatly cluster based upon their unique chemicals, geochemical signatures. The main clusters that we're gonna be talking about today involve this light blue one and in the Tsakun Yats range that's very close to uh, Gagarin, it's their most proximate source. And then further flung sites such as the Hatis complex and the uh, uh, Kutansar complex and the Gagan range uh, the Southwest Aragot sources that are the Arteni sources on the Southwest slope of Mount Aragot. Uh, these are the ones that we'll be talking most about. Let me begin by detailing the early Bronze Age obsidian economy as seen from our PXRF study. 
Overall, we examined 338 samples from the EB levels at Gagro during our initial uh, phase of study. Seven sources were represented in the sample with no representation from Agvorik, this one here, and from Sunik down in Southern Armenia. Perhaps not surprisingly, the Zakun Yach source, as I mentioned, just 20 kilometers southeast of Gegerud, was the best represented in the sample. That's the um, blue here, with the Arteni complexes in the orange coming in second. There was also a strong representation of an Anatolian source, which our initial survey did not capture, but its subsequently uh, further testing suggests was sorry, Kamish near Kars. If we take a closer look and exclude the local Tsakun Yat samples, 22%, this dark gray slice of the pie here, comes from this Anatolian source that we think, think is Sari Kamish. The picture of the obsidians gets more interesting if we break out the data by phase. Of the total early bronze sample, 99 obsidians could be more precisely dated to either the EB1 or EB2 phases of occupation. If we again attend specifically to the remains from non-local sources, that is not the Tsakunyat source, the two occupations present somewhat different exchange network profiles. During the early bronze one phase, the Gutansar complex of the Northern Gegam range, that's this one here, the center, the top yellow one, and the uh, light gray in the pie chart, uh, is clearly the predominant. In contrast, during the early bronze two phase, it's the Arteni sources, the Southwest Aragat sources that are here in the red dot, that are clearly the best represented. It's quite possible then that Gegerot's two early bronze occupations, remember they're separated by a 40 or so year hiatus, may represent uh, the distinct influxes of, migration, of migrants into the Tsakovit Plain from communities in different regions who brought with them their knowledge of specific sources and maintained the social ties required for durable exchange networks. It is also worth noting that while the proportion of sources represented at Gegerot does shift over time, it is the same four complexes, the North Gegam, the Southwest Aragats, the Southern Georgian Chikiani source, and the Central Gegam source that predominate, creating Gegerot, uh, sorry, uh, putting Gegerot into a durable set of exchange relationships that extended in all directions, North, West, and Southeast for distances of over hundred kilometers. This is a situation that we see will change during the late Bronze Age. Now, in order to attend to whether this network was differentially represented across the site of Gegerot during the early Bronze Age, we examined the heterodoxy of assemblages across the seven main excavation units that comprise the majority sample of obsidians, representing each of the four major districts of the site, the citadel, the terrace, the lower town, and sorry, the west citadel, the east citadel, the Western Terrace and the lower town, the lower slope. T17 and T18, which are two units right here on the Western uh, edge of the Citadel, were the least heterodox of the early Bronze Age context. You can see their plots here. But interestingly, they privileged very different sources. One, the Zakunyats, and another, the North Gegam source. This is a rather unusual situation, given that as we excavated these areas, our working assumption was that they were rooms of a single EB2 residence. Now, almost all of the early Bronze Age sample contexts relied heavily on obsidians from local Tsakun Yats complex sources, not surprising. But T18 and T38, so T18, the northern one of these two, and T38, well down here at the Western Slope, provide important exceptions. In T18, which you see here circled in red, over 80% of the recovered obsidians affiliated with the North Gegam Gutensar complex to the Southeast. While in T38, which you see here on the right end here, almost 40% of the sample affiliated with the Anatolian source to the West. Indeed, T38 alone yielded more than 50% of the total number of Anatolian obsidians from Gegerot, suggesting that the res residents of the sites Western slope, lower Western slope, participated in exchange networks that reached in different directions from their neighbors on the Citadel. 
Now to shift to the late Bronze Age, during the, uh, this phase, we see greater heterodoxy of obsidian remains at Gegerut with substantial representation of the Southwest Aragots and the North Gagam Hantis complexes. This appears to be a somewhat unusual so, uh, source profile. Contrast, for example, the source profile for Aragazi Bear, which is just five kilometers to the southeast of Gegerud. Here we see what I think we can consider a more typical late bronze obsidian profile, where over 80% of the remains derived from the nearest proximate source at Nzakunyat's range. And there was just a small percentage of wider ranging imports. At Gegerud, in contrast, 55% of the obsidian corpus came from non-local sources. Thus, underlying our suggestion based on the ceramic exchange economy, that Gegero clearly occupied a distinct privileged position in the South Caucasian Late Bronze Age exchange economy. Now, even as Gegero was more heterodox in the overall representation of non-local South Caucasus sources, we also see an overall constriction in wide scale connectivity. If we examine the Late Bronze Age data by phase, we see a rather surprising long-term trend away from the use of local Tsakunyat's obsidian in the light blue here, and an increase in the North Gagam Hatis complex to the Southeast shown here in yellow. You can see in the graph here, the distinction between the LB1 uh, assemblage and the LB2 assemblage. There is also considerable reduction in the heterodoxy of the sample set over time. And by the late bronze two phase at Gegerot, less than 10% of obsidian remains at the site arrive from a distance of any more than 60 kilometers. In economic terms, what I think this suggests is it provides additional support for the idea that the politicization of the late Bronze Age economy and the emergence of Gegerot's privileged position within it brought with it not just a reduction in overall mobility that we saw in the isotopic data, but also an increasing constriction in everyday commodity spheres. Now, this is in some contrast to long distance trade, what we might think of as elite trade. So let me turn now to long distance exchange. Let me first begin with the early Bronze Age where our evidence for long distance exchange is simply not very extensive. Most of the Kuroroxes assemblages from the talk will be plain evidence, primarily local interactions amongst largely similar agro-pastoral communities. Now I highlight one possible exception. It's this rather unique necklace that we recovered from an early Bronze Age floor on the Citadel at Gerot. The find included 99 metal beads, 88 of Chalcedony and 217 of Talc. Khachtur Melik Setian of the Institute of Geology and Ernst Branicka, now at the University of Heidelberg, used energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence to determine major and trace element composition. They found, found that the metal beads were generally of three types. Double volute beads that you see here consisted of arsenical copper with 4.6 to 6.1% arsenic. The conical and spherical teardrop shaped beads consisted of leaded arsenical copper. And the cylindrical and barrel shaped beads were made of a copper oil uh, alloy with extremely high arsenic contents, ranging between 15.8 and 19.4%. The variation in the alloys suggested strongly to Melixetian and Pernichka that multiple ore sources were involved in the production of the beads. This would necessarily suggest an exchange network of some distance that reached beyond the locally available copper ores of the immediate Pombok range. However, how far those connections might have stretched is not at present known. Now, long distance exchange during the late Bronze Age is a bit, or, bit better well documented, including in the Dokovi Plain, thanks largely to several finds of imported items from the site of Gegero. What I'll concentrate on here are two cylinder seals that we recorded at the site. One was found just outside uh, the East Citadel Shrine. So many of you may know the site of uh, Gerot has a number of, of uh, shrines that were in place on the Citadel and Western Terrace during the late Bronze Age and were part of the reason for its uh, privilege within the economic framework of the region. And so we found one of the seals uh, uh, outside uh, the East Shrine and one inside the West Terrace Shrine. The first seal, 
shows three figures. Two are shown in profile facing each other. Let me highlight that, there you go. One in a long robe and cap and the other in a tiered robe with arms raised and hands clasped. Between the two figures is a vertical spear and a circular orb surrounded by five or six dots. Now you can see that at the top here. The third figure over here on the left uh, shown in, is shown in frontal view with hands clasped. To the right of the figure, the composition is divided into two registers, you can see here, separated by a running uh, spiral strand. The upper register shows a quadruped, maybe a goat with head down to graze while the lower register shows two reclining quadrupeds that have been interpreted as bulls, back to back with tails entwined. The second seal is divided into two frames separated by herringbone bands that enclose uh, two reclining quadrupeds, which we think may be stags. In the second section on the right are three poorly preserved motifs that may represent human heads shown in profile facing uh, toward the top of the seal. Now, both of these seals are of the Mitannian common style that gained popularity across ancient Southwest Asia and the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean during the 15th and 14th centuries BC. Dominique Cologne has suggested that they were manufactured in Rashamra or Ugarit. And similar seals have been documented in sites in the South Caucasus in tombs. But to my knowledge, the Gegerot seals are the first to be found in a living use context presumably drawn in by the same forces that shaped the site's privilege in the local and regional exchange economies documented in ceramic and obsidian remains. Now, when we put all the late Bronze Age exchange data together from subsistence regimes to local, regional and long distance commodity transactions, I think we see three related forces at work. First, we see the emergence of a political economy defined by Gegerot's unique privilege in material flows and by a broader ability of emergent elites to command the labor required to build large fortified centers. Second, we see a constriction of regional economies of resource exchange, represented most clearly by the obsidian trade, but also by the reduction in overall human and herd mobility documented in the isotopic data. Lastly, even as mass economies were increasingly constrained in their available commodity sources, elite access to long distance goods appears to have actually increased. This included not only finished products like seals, but we know also that elite materials such as precious metals and stones like carnelian were moving into and across the South Caucasus during the late Bronze Age at considerable rates. The result of these scaled economies was a dramatic rise in inequality, relations of privilege and power that were etched deep into the landscape of the Tsakovic Plain and the wider South Caucasus during the late Bronze Age. Today, inequality continues to shape the lives of the residents of the Tsakovic Plain. The collapse of the USSR brought with it a significant rise in poverty and unemployment in the region. In establishing the Aragats Foundation, our team wanted to find ways to utilize our scientific work to in some measure offer local communities tools for addressing systemic inequality. While heritage preservation and tourism is one area uh, avenue that we continue to consider, such plans take years or even decades to impact local communities, if ever. So Project Aragats co-director Lori Kachadorian developed a way for our foundation to be more immediately impactful. During the summer of 2017 and 18, Kachadorian and Armine Harutunyan redirected their research team to a post a week long camp known as Camp Aragats for girls ages 12 to 17 from communities adjacent to our research sites. Our focus on young women was driven by keen awareness of the constraints on the futures that girls in the villages are allowed to imagine for themselves. Moreover, while Aragats had contributed wages and an education in archaeological field techniques to several generations of the male residents of local communities, we had not made a substantial effort to provide concrete benefits for female residents of the region as well. Kachadorian decided early in the planning process for the camp that it would not focus on teaching heritage per se, but would instead use archaeology as a vehicle for stimulating interest in STEM fields. So the curriculum of the camp focused relatively little on detailing the past, 
and, mo and focused more on providing a hands-on experience with an array of methods from paleobotany to human hostiology to zooarchaeology and remote sensing. Their response from the participants to Ketchadorian's exit interviews suggests the camp was highly impactful. Even as we unfortunately must await a return to more normal times for us to catch up with our alumni and further develop the camp's educational model. The Aragots Foundation has recently embarked on a new area of activity focused on remote heritage monitoring. As many of you know, autumn 2020 brought with it a renewal of hostilities between Armenian and Azerbaijani forces over the disputed enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh. The Russia brokered ceasefire transferred a significant set of territories that had been under de facto Armenian control to Azerbaijani administration, which is shown in this BBC map as the hatched red and white area. This development has con triggered considerable alarm in the heritage and archaeological communities based on Azerbaijan's record as a steward of Armenian cultural heritage sites. In Azerbaijan's Nakhchivan province, there is well-documented evidence for the destruction of 89 Armenian churches, as well as many other heritage sites, including the medieval Khachkar Cemetery at Julfa. Between 1998 and 2004, the site had been attacked repeatedly despite protests of heritage authorities and others. In December of 2006, the Azerbaijani army deployed to the site hacked apart the delicately carved stones with picks and machinery, bulldozed the plateau, and dumped the evidence into the Arox River. So there is reason to be concerned regarding the approximately 1,100 heritage sites in the Nagorno-Karabakh region that have now come under Azerbaijan's administrative control. In response, Project Aragots and the Aragots Foundation are now implementing a program to use satellite-based remote sensing to monitor cultural heritage sites in the region. We are conducting this work in collaboration with partners on the ground who help guide our investigations and provide additional documentation. Our goals are twofold. First, and our highest priority, is that we seek to deter programs of cultural genocide and heritage erasure through visible surveillance of threatened sites. But second, we wish to provide a forensic record of heritage damaged or destroyed in order to provide supporting materials for future efforts to hold perpetrators accountable, whether through local legal institutions or the International Criminal Court. This program, co-directed by Lori Ketchdorian, Ian Lindsay, and myself, will provide regular assessments of heritage impacts that we hope will be of use to local authorities and international bodies that stand together against heritage, erasure, and cultural genocide. Although there is already evidence of violence against cultural heritage during and after the conflict, it is collectively our shared hope that this work will prove to be unnecessary and that a new era of respect and cooperation can open previously unimagined new possibilities for collaboration, investigation, and illumination of the region's rich past. These are the core values that have guided Project Aragots since our founding and that will continue to shape our work going forward. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for your lecture and congratulations for your excellent work with the Aragats Foundation and of course uh, the project Aragats in its uh, entirety. Um, so th this final part, as I mentioned in this introduction, is dedicated uh, to your questions. Uh, uh, therefore, if you do have questions, uh, please use the live chat and write them down and I'm going to read to our speaker. Um, in the meantime, since uh, we don't have uh, uh, any questions for the moment, uh, I would like to ask you something. Um, well, the, the project, Project Haragat, uh, has collected numerous types of, uh, of uh, archaeological data, as you have shown in your presentation. Um, therefore, I'm wondering, um, how do all these many different disciplines, and I'm thinking about uh, uh, bioarchaeology, geology, and so on, um, how do all these disciplines coexist in this project? That's a terrific question. Let me stop my screen share here so we can okay. chat. Um, that is a terrific question, and it is a fundamental uh, data challenge. 
uh, because we have this uh, ethos of collaboration where we work very effectively together, we don't have a, a personal challenge in the sense of trying to negotiate where the boundaries between the different projects exist. We're kind of an overall umbrella organization. The real challenge is kind of a data flow issue because you have very different kinds of information. So when we establish the database for Project Argods, it was with a kind of basic excavation and survey kind of infrastructure in mind. And then suddenly we're getting isotope data and PXRF data, which are of all different and heterogeneous kinds. Uh, and the only way that we've really figured out how to balance all of these is through relatively constant communication of our findings. When we were in the field, this was easy because we would come together and we would basically all come to understand each other's work. Uh, the end of the active field work for the moment has created a greater challenge that we need to overcome through Zoom, uh, which is, as you can see, not ideal to overcome this challenge through Zoom. Uh, but uh, uh, regular communication does help. Uh, and also a regular sense of the publication pipeline for all of the team members also helps because then we can actually get access and afford access to data through those publications. So you know, in some ways it's imperfect uh, because we're all working with, in some ways, very different data sets. Um, but I think the collaborative nature of it uh, helps get to get, get a, across the friction that might prevent that kind of data sharing. Thank you so much. I, I can imagine how hard it is, especially now, which you, you have to, to meet people by, uh, video call and not in person. It's quite a, it's quite challenging. Yeah. So hopefully it's temporary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Uh, we have a question. So um, in the Upper Tigris and in Georgia was found evidence of nomadic or semi-nomadic pig herders. We find that even nowadays. Do you think it could be the case also at your site of do you exclude that? I don't think we fundamentally exclude it based just upon the pig data, because I mean, I think it's just a one other data point. We, I think what we're seeing in a number of the sites in the region, uh, like uh, not only Gagarod, but also Karnut uh, and others, is generally long term uh, year round uh, agropastoral communities. Now, that does not forestall the possibility that segments of these communities would have had wider transhuman ranges. Uh, certainly in the obsidian data where we see a connection across 100 kilometers or so within the obsidian exchange network, that does suggest that there's at least movement of things and presumably people were carrying those. So there's probably segments of the communities that are more wide ranging and certainly the uh, rather swift expansion of the Kororoxies across a vast territory suggests that mobility must be part of the community. But what we don't see is that the entire community invested in this movement. It may be worth contemplating that this, the chronological information now suggests that the uh, occupations of Gagarot were relatively short, each one of them, the first one about a, hundred, a little over 100 years, and the second one a little bit over 150 years, so it may be that some of the movement in Kuroaxi's communities is not from communities moving, but over the long term communities expanding. And what we need is greater chronological resolution at other areas to find out, okay, Gegero was abandoned. And now we see the fluorescence of new sites that sort of syncopate that chronology. I think this gives uh, uh, rise to a sense that chronology across the totality of the Kuroroxy's sphere is really important to get a sense of that. And I actually have a graduate student, Anna Paula Passerini, who's doing a project on Kuroroxy's chronology and temporal rhythms that's going to be, I think, really quite fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, sorry, I'm looking at the chat. We have another question. Um, yeah, another question. Are you doing anything to conserve the sites uh, in your server? So the, the, this was one of the areas where our heritage and tourism initiative was really uh, first off. We developed plans for conservation first at the site of Takohovit, 
because it seemed like it was the larger, it had a large village, a larger village next to it. And that was the area where we were planning to start. We're still sort of developing the plans for that. Uh, it takes a considerable amount of time to develop not only the blueprints for what the conservation project will look like, but then to do the fundraising uh, alongside that. There have been a number of events over the course of the last year that have made these projects probably a little bit longer term, uh, but we are still looking at, at the large term uh, uh, preservation. At Gegerot, the site, uh, we, always we always preserve the sites by reburying everything that we do. So it would involve a re-excavation and then a, a real conservation program. At Gegerot, the site is a little bit less robust than the very large iron three rooms that we have at Takahobit. Uh, and so it would take a little bit more uh, subtlety in how to present it, uh, but it is the, the thing that this region has going for it in terms of conservation heritage tourism is it's right on the main road between Yerevan and Banadzor and then Tbilisi. So it has a kind of uh, uh, throughput of potential visitors that I think it would be useful for us to consider capturing in working alongside the villages uh, where our work has been situated. But that's a long-term project. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, and there's also a congratulation. This question was uh, um, written by Giorgio Buccellati, who is also congratulated with you for your very interesting lecture. Um, a new question by Stefano Valentini. Congrats for the presentation and the project. During the introduction, I saw a picture of a corgan with two non-concentric stone circles. We have excavated a similar structure in Azerbaijan. Um, can you give us some other details about the structure? Sure. So the Gagarot corgans have this relatively unique, well, actually, maybe it's not all that unique, but the, the circles within the corgan construction are almost always non-concentric. So you have the outer, what's often still times referred to as the cromlech that encircles the entire territory. You have the chamber sunk sometimes in the center, sometimes off center uh, from the, the outlying circle. And then you have a subsidiary circle of uh, mostly basalt stones set around that. Uh, and sometimes yet another circle as well. Sometimes there's a subsidiary chamber that's encircled as well. Uh, and one of the interesting things we see is that there's a combination of basalt, which is used for most of the construction, but then you sometimes find granite stuck in very conspicuous points, like at the far northern part of the circle. And I'd be interested to hear if this is something that other people have found as well. And indeed, then when they build the mound over the top, it's a mound of cobbles. Uh, oftentimes there's a mound directly over the inner circle, and then a second mound a second stone tumulus over the entirety of the construction. And there again, we find that in the construction of these cobble tumuli, oftentimes there's a clear selection for both the sort of gray, dull stones of basalt interspersed with uh, more white talc or granite stones that would have provided a kind of sheen to the construction. So they're clearly thinking about the color matrix of these uh, constructions as they're putting them together. And the Asymmetry of them, I think, is also quite fascinating as well. I don't have a, an answer for what underlies that. That's probably something for me to contemplate within the meta realm of metaphysics, uh, but it's something to think about. Thank you. Um, for the moment, it seems we don't have uh, any more questions. Um, no, okay. Any more questions? So I would like to thank you once more for your lecture. Uh, it, it was really, really fascinating, uh, and so thank you so much. Uh, My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I would like to thank our public as well. Uh, thank you for, for being with us today. And uh, um, our next encounter will be next Wednesday, February the 17th, uh, at 5 p.m. Italy time, as usual. Uh, Michele Nucciotti will discuss Crusader Ayubid and Mamluk Selman in southern Jordan recent results from the Italian archaeological mission in Petra and Schobach. Thank you so much and see you next week.